Hey, Garrett. Yes? You're a loser. That's true. What, are you going to go to home and cry to your mummy? Uh, no, I live by myself. Yeah, you can take a drive over to your Jehovah's Witness mother and cry. <laughs> and she's like, what's wrong, heathen? <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Digital Drive-In Podcast, where we talk about our favorite where movies and what we love about them and why we love them so, so very, very much. My name is Alex. I'm joined, as always, by my very, very mummified and disgusting co-host, Garrett, hmm. who doesn't have a tongue. And today, we are taking a look at a little film from 1999 called The Mummy, starring Brendan Fraser and directed by Stephen Sommers. Isn't that right, Garrett? That's what I hear. Uh, what is this movie about? Why did we choose it? Okay, that's two questions. Uh, the, Put them together. The movie is about a mummy that comes back in 1920s Egypt Ooh, to, find, to find his lost love. The Roaring Twenties. It's a, it's a rom-com. <laughs> and directed by Woody Allen. <laughs> wow. There's like, uh, there's, there's mummies everywhere. Look at all these mummies. Wow. Can't sand, believe so many mummies. The sand gets everywhere. It's irritating. <laughs> it's coarse and it's rough. I, I feel like I'm doing a, wow. I'm like Holly Hunter doing a <laughs> <laughs> Wow, there's obviously something wrong with my mouth. <laughs> wow. Wow. So why did we watch it? Yeah, that's your question. That's me question? Uh, no, you're no, the one I that told me to even. buy it. I had to buy it because you wanted to watch it. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's not true. I didn't make you buy anything. You did. Free, I didn't have it, and you wanted person. to watch it. You could have illegally got it. Oh, like, I like the criminal you are. Whatever. We picked you this film. download a movie. Because it's lots Please. and lots of fun. Uh, it was on my a, list eventually. It's a nice little adventure fl flick that has some horror elements to it. And it has uh, Brendan Fraser, who I don't know about you, Garrett, but I like a lot. And we haven't really seen all too much of him. For sort of upsetting reasons that we won't get into. Yeah, it, also, I mean, it also has Rachel. I think... Oh, you go ahead. This is probably his best film. Oh, yeah. Like, it's not like he's like a fantastic no, actor. No, but I mean, this makes up for if he was, if he just did like a thousand of these, it would be awesome. Well, he's been in fifty-six movies according to Letterbox. I mean, most of them are pretty garbage, though. Well, Except for this and number two and Looney Tunes back in action. I'm gonna slap you dead. It also has Rachel Weisz in it, who uh, just was in The Favorite, which was one of our favorite movies of 2018. So it was a nice little. There's no way that's the same person. <laughs> She was also in The Lobster. That is true, and we also did that only a few weeks ago. I guess this is just the Rachel Vice podcast, isn't it? I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not terrible. It's not terrible. Uh, the Mummy is, of course, about a mummy with a U. A scary monster, right, Garrett? The Mummy. Yeah. But this is a little bit different than your average monster movie, isn't it? It's not exactly like the old 30s and 40s ones. Um, I mean, it's... You know, it's funny. It's actually closer to those than probably any of the new newer movies are, um, mm -hmm. because it is. Uh, this is a little more jaunty. There's there's a lot more of a comedic undertone to it. There's a lot of sarcasm. Um, right. It's it, it's actually really good in dialogue. There's a lot of quotable lines. Um, and it's like it's one of those things. I would say that. It doesn't really age because of the having the period setting. So it doesn't even necessarily feel like an, a, a late 90s movie, but it also, you know, it, it works just as well in 2019. Yeah, that was something I noticed, too, was how well it, it held up. It doesn't make any like pop culture references that date it like crazy. I would I would say there's probably like no one is miscast. And this actually kind of relies on more than just the lead character. OK, yeah. 
I would agree. Like, a, a lot of the side, like, the villain is really good. So, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it Arnold Vosloo? Sure. Um, v- Vuzlu? I don't know. Something like Vyoslo? that. It's, it's one. Of, it's one of those three. Probably the yeah, it's. One. He's the from South one. Africa? Okay. And he has a very interesting and distinct look. Right. And um, so I think he kind of fits as having, he kind of has like an old timey look. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his head was shaved, which, of course, the Egyptians were known for not having hair. Right. So they could rub poop all over themselves. (laughs) I I mean, I'm not going to touch that. (laughs) Good. Seems like a race thing. Um, you know, so it's like you have you have a really good guy that, as a villain, he doesn't really have a lot of dialogue. No. But, you know, I think he did, like, a lot of the motion capture, and then he obviously plays himself at the beginning and the ends of the film. So mm-hmm. uh, he, he did a good job with that. And then you have, like, a lot of uh, secondary characters where even if you don't know what the actors' names are, you kind of, like, recognize them from being in other stuff. And sure. they, they are, are all, like, visually distinctive and characteristically distinctive enough to to have fun with them kind of, like, being stereotypes rather than them being right. too in-depth. But it's easy to that keep I them all straight. Too, especially on the three, like, American guys, they all look very much different. There's, like, your cowboy mm-hmm. guy and your glasses smart guy. Yeah. Yeah, and it really, I think it helps adds to, especially those three characters kind of, when compared with our leads, kind of make our leads seem a hell of a lot smarter, even though they may be making mistakes. It, it, it just shows that they know what kind of what they're doing, I guess. But you're talking about stereotypes, too, but maybe it's just that. Yeah. Well, and you have like different tiers of antagonist against the protagonist, but like not everyone is evil. Right. You know, it's like I think that that's important in a film, too, is you kind of have like different gray areas. I mean, as we talked about a little bit with Indiana Jones, how like Indiana Jones could have been pushed to be the guy that was working with the Nazis and, mm-hmm. and finding treasures just for himself. But he, he was shades off of that. and He had made um, decisions that changed what kind of character he was. And I feel like, right. you know, Brendan was like that against like the other archaeologist kind of guy that was wanting to get the the book for his own nefarious purposes. But then he was the one that was screaming like, don't read it out loud. And, you know, so it's like yeah. s- some of it could just be like greed and not necessarily complete evil wanting to take over the world or, or sure. do anything nefarious. You know? It just wants the money and it kind of what does them in. Yeah. Looking after fortune and glory. Mm-hmm. And I like uh, speaking of some of the side characters. Do you have ones, I guess, if those are the smaller tiered, there's like the mid tiers like Benny. Mm-hmm. Who is fucking hysterical? You just play that that actor, and I don't know who it is. Kevin J. O'Connor. Right, he plays that sort of uh, slimy rat role so incredibly well. Yeah, he's been in a couple of Paul Thomas Anderson films. Oh yeah, but you can never kind of tell what side he's on when he's bouncing around right. the screen. It's, it's Always, uh, it's it's fun when going back and watching it uh, again, seeing Benny sort of fuck around with everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. He was also in GI Joe: The Rise of Cobra, which was also directed by Steven Stevens and Van Helsing too. Yep, Van Helsing is actually decent. Not, I'd good. have to watch it again. I don't remember it being very good. But... Kind of weird. It wasn't. It's not great. I think you just like Kate Beckinsale. Sure. I am Pete Davidson, after all. <laughs> Weird, eh? Crazy. No, I meant Pete Beckinsdale. Pete Beckinsdale, pretty soon. Pete Davidson, you know? I understand what you're saying. I uh, must have a massive dang. It's not because he has money, that's for sure. <laughs> Excuse me while I whip this out. Where are all the white women at? <laughs> hey, Bob. What about our lead characters, though, Garrett? We kind of have two hey, main Brendan? leads and a, and a supporting lead, I guess. I don't know. But what do you think about their characters themselves and how they how they fit in the movie? Brendan yeah, I mean, Rachel, I mean, I know you like Brendan because he's Canadian. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like he's he's sort of almost like, I mean, he's like an adventurer. He's almost like a, a like a football player. He's kind of jockey. You know, he he has, but he's charismatic. It's like he's he's funny. 
Mm-hmm. He's able to pull off the character pretty well, you know. I mean, in a, in a couple aspects, he kind of Harrison Ford's it a bit, where like you could almost right. see him being a, a bit of a Han Solo, Indiana Jones type. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's what a lot of this movie, I, I think, is, is it was to that. I think like being charismatic and having a cocky attitude, but then also having to rely on other people to help him out. It's like the it it has a pretty good balance of characterization, which really helps. It's not real one sided, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I think like indie kind of is the one man show, right? But having this sort of there's a lot of things that Rick can't do that, uh, Evelyn, I guess, can. And right. Then, I mean, that's you know, the thing. Is... We we're talking about strong female roles a couple of weeks ago, I think. Right. And it's like, right. This is a, this is another strong female role that can do. She can hold her own. She can do a lot more than. People give her credit for. And I think it's uh, it's it's cool to see, especially in a, in, a, in a film set back in this time period to see her kind of take charge. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's sort of it's like Brendan is the muscle. Rachel is the brains, and then the other guys just kind of the straight man for them to play off of. Okay. You cut out a massive bunch there. Oh, sorry. Must it's have been uh, pop. it's uh, Brendan is the muscle, right? And then Rachel is the brains, and then the John Hannah, her brother character, is more of the straight man that they kind of like play stuff off of, and he's like completely yeah, nervous. yeah. He's more just there for the comedy, but he also has yeah. his time to shine a little bit too, right? Sure. They never play uh, him off like a total fool. Right. He does save the day after all. If he didn't read that book, they'd all be dead. Look at that. And it's interesting because as strong of a female role, she still ends up as the damsel in distress in a way. But at the right. same time, she's still... It's an interesting scene, and I, and I like that scene a lot where she's kind of taken away by Imhotep because I think she's really the only one... Well between her and Rick, at least, that acknowledge the fact that if uh, she doesn't go with him, they're all going to die. They're just going to murder everybody, even though they try to anyway. Right. She really understands that it's the only way to possibly stop him is to just roll with things for a little bit. So. Yeah, I mean, she's very much so the Princess Leia character. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and it almost feels like Somers was uh, writing off of that those kinds of, of character archetypes, I suppose. So especially we were talking about Indiana Jones it does feel a lot like that just in general, but with the princess Leia kind of character to have, it kind of feels like those are, he just wanted to write a film that was like at those uh, films levels in terms of fun. I think, I think that's all this movie. That's all I cared about was just making an entertaining movie. Right. And like setting it back in the twenties, I mean, that's when these types of movies that George Lucas was inspired by was made. Mm-hmm. You know, where they had those serials and, and the old, you know, horror films and the forbidden tombs and stuff, you know, went around mm-hmm. the 20s and 30s. So, you know, it's just it, it, the reason it works and has been around for so long is because, the you know, there's there's something of truth about it. Yeah. But I think that the uh, what this excels most in, I think, is a blend of genres kind of. I don't know if you would agree. It's an adventure film, I would say, first and first. But when it does the horror elements, I think it does them quite well. It's shot quite well, like a horror film is. Right. Yeah. I think it, it helps, certainly, with the entertainment factor. But I think it's interesting to see something pull off that blend so well. The adventure, the comedy, the horror. It never feels tonally off, even though it is kind of balancing all of these different elements at the same time. You know, the horror scenes are maybe lifted up a little bit by Benny making some stupid remark or something like that, but it never feels out of place, I don't think, at least. Kind of all works together, but maybe it's essentially like a <laughs> like a theme park ride, I guess, of a film. I'll get to that later. That's a little seed yeah. for the future. I mean, it, it's kind of like the Marvel formula. Sure, yeah. And I th- I think it benefits too because this was still a time when CG was still used sparingly. Mm-hmm. So they're not like they're actually filming on real sets. There's a lot of practicality to it. There are CG shots, but those are used to amplify or do things that you couldn't really do practically. Right. Like or be convincing. 
Yeah, I mean, like, ha- have have a guy that has pieces of him and he's real thin. Well, you can't really do that. Having thousands of bugs going down one specific path, you really, you know, that would be really difficult to do. And it looks so. pretty good. Yeah. For the time, at least. I think that's ILM just in general, but it holds up pretty well uh, nearly, well, 20 years later. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's like... it. Because of the fact it doesn't take itself too serious and you're having fun with it, it doesn't stick out as much as something that's trying to fool you. Mm-hmm. This is just trying to get a specific idea across, and I think it does that. So, Right. Gosh, do we watch it too, uh, too much in advance? It's hard to talk about. Um, well, it's, uh, the other thing that's hard to talk about is it's not wholly original. Right. So you end up like comparing it to other things that are fun. Like... You know, it it does a good mix of CG and practical, just like Jurassic Park that we talked about. Right. Yeah. And, it, and it does a really good uh, mix of uh, the guy being dashing and meat-headed, just like Indiana Jones, which was the first episode we talked about. Right, yeah. You know, so it's like you don't want to go back and do too many of the exact same things, but it's really fucking fun. Right. And it's like, how yeah. do you convey... It's almost like doing a, a, a comedy. That was a really good comedy. Do you want to just repeat the jokes? <laughs> Yeah, which is, you I know. mean, that's why we try, well, we don't do comedies often here. Right. They very rarely have that kind of substance to talk about without, like you said, just repeating the jokes. But I think it's kind of a testament to this film then that it can, in a sense, borrow so many elements, but also make itself kind of original and tell a story in an engaging, exciting way without having you feel like you've seen it before, even though you kind of have. Right, yeah, that, it's that's the thing. It's not like, well, I've already seen this before. There's no use watching this. It's right. like, it's it's a fun, it's almost like a nostalgia trip. It's like seeing it again after so many years, I'm still like, yeah, this is really fun. I still really like it. It's, yeah. it's just a good movie to put on. It puts you in a good mood. It's like we said, even though there was some horrific scenes, there's perilous scenes, characters die, but you're still you're having a fun time through the whole thing. And that's like extremely yeah. difficult to pull off. Right. And if you're saying nostalgia for me. I don't know if I said it while we were watching it, but I kind of grew up with this movie, too. It came out after I was born, but not, not by much. But I did watch it kind of along with that Indiana Jones and with Star Wars and with Back to the Future and all of those. Not as much as those, but I watched it kind of at that same time, too. So watching it again in preparation for this podcast, I just found myself uh, kind of harking back to those old times, you know, uh-huh. it, it felt like a nostalgia trip for sure. Like you were saying, or so more is, ways than one is nine is 1999. Like one of the best years for cinema. It's not bad. What else came out? in 99 matrix, huh? Matrix fight club. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, American beauty. I don't know how well that's aged. <laughs> it's still great. Space. Yeah, well, now it's probably really weird. Uh, episode one, there were still Star Wars movies coming out all the way back then. <laughs> what? Uh, to- Toy Story 2, The Sixth Sense. Yeah, it the was. The Iron good. Giant. Here. Green Mile, Office Space, Galaxy Quest. No, it's just bizarre that this film was kind of forgotten, I think, among critics. Or you were saying it had a 48 on Metacritic? Right? Yeah, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with people. It's like, did you not have fun? <laughs> it has a 58 apparently on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, and of course, Rotten Tomatoes is weird. It's like it's just basically like how many. Well, people their average, average rating is also a 5.8 out of 10. Uh, the consensus for it is it's difficult to make a persuasive argument for the mummy as any kind of meaningful cinematic achievement, but it's undeniably fun to watch. Yeah, but I mean, so basically, I th- what we said, but we're not taking it as a negative, right? And it's like, how many movies really are like an artistic achievement? There right. is maybe one or two a year. <laughs> right. And I mean, there's like, there's like a handful out of all of the hundreds of movies. Yeah. And like, like you're saying, Rotten Tomatoes isn't wholly accurate for that kind of stuff. But you could take Roger Ebert, I'm pretty sure, as a as a reliable source. And he gave it three out of four. Yeah. And saying the exact same thing. There's hardly a thing I can say in its favor, except that I was cheer I was cheered by nearly every minute of it. I cannot argue for the script, the direction or acting or even the mummy, but I can say that I was not bored and sometimes I was unreasonably pleased. So it's just a fucking good time. It's a good time movie. Yeah. It's enjoyable to watch. It had an $80 million budget. Really? Eh? That's kind of high. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. 
Yeah. And on and on IMDb, it has a 7.0 rating. Yeah, and that works. That's yeah, so that's pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, I give it a little higher, but that's also a nostalgia point. You rated it. it perfect, didn't you? No, I have it's a, probably a, it's probably a 9.5 for me. I'd say, but some <laughs> of it is some of it is the, the nostalgia greatest, plan. Greatest movies of all time. <laughs> Top ten at least. Who needs Kubrick? I've got the mummy. Yeah, it's not like he had a, a movie come out that year. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've never seen that. So it's, yeah. you're saying it's one of the top 200 films of all time? Absolutely. No. Well, you only rated 155 films five stars. <laughs> and you okay. rated 148 four and a half. So you're saying it's one of the top 300 films? I haven't seen a lot of films, Garrett. <laughs> Just give me a hard time. Yeah, you're fucking... Tearing me to shreds here. You breaking my balls. <laughs> hey, why are you breaking my balls? Fuckhead. Yep, that's me, Fuckhead McGee. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say it is one of the most entertaining films. Of- Especially with it not being a straight comedy. Yeah. There's a lot of movies that intentionally uh, try to make you feel good. And I, I feel like this one was just a good time. You could tell the people that were making it were enjoying yeah. it. Yeah. Except for old Spaghetti here who's yawning because he doesn't want to actually do the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> old Spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but this film... I don't know where I was going with that. No harm ever came from reading a book or farting in a chair. Irony. Fuck, what else can we talk about? Do you want to talk about pop music some of the the scary elements like how fucking awful would it be to have a little bug crawl up your leg and dig into your skin and like crawl up through your skin and smash into your way into its brain well uh, because i don't live in australia i specifically kept myself out of that area yeah but whoa, could you imagine though no i can't imagine that would be sick would it be horrifying weren't it, you it terrified would be horrible it would be horrible i mean could you imagine losing your eyes and then the person coming back and sucking the rest of your stuff out. <laughs> sucking the rest of my what? Yeah. Fish big enough to eat your whole. Ew. I love that, though. I love how he uh, slowly regenerates. Like, he, he absorbs yeah. the lifeblood out of one person, and, like, you see him kind of come back a little bit f- more from his decayed state towards his normal one. Yeah, it's it's a good storytelling device. It's the ticking clock, where you, you know there's a limited amount, and he has to do it within a certain time. Right. Once he once he fills up full, you'll probably he'll probably kill you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost like a video game mechanic. Sure. Yeah. It is kind of like a big video game boss fight at the end too. Uh huh. See now now who's fucking bored over there? Fucking Doctor Jacobo Booby Booby. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was uh, thinking about the guys from Uncharted should do it. Oh right. <laughs> Maybe we can get Bioware, because they'll have nothing to do here shortly. Oh, do-do-do-do-do-do. Hey, speaking of which, did you see that they had a thing where the um, damage done by the gun, the yes. entry gun? Oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> yes. I can't okay. even believe that. That's horrible. <laughs> I like I like when he's, when the guy's like, what, what do you want us to do? What are we going to do? And he's like, I'll go get help. Wait here. <laughs> And jumps over the boat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fucking hilarious. There's, there's a lot of really good. It's Gags. just, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. It's like, hey, O'Connell, looks like we got all the horses. Hey, Benny, looks like you're on the wrong side of the river. Bitch. You should have added the bitch at the end. <laughs> that was, that was the Jesse from Breaking Bad. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of good comedy bits in this movie, though. I think it's it's quite hilarious. And the Blu-ray looks nice too. I agree. It was my first time watching it on Blu-ray, and I thought that it was a it, it was it held up pretty well. And we talked about it. the The lighting is like really well done. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just talk about the cinematography in general because I thought it was actually shockingly good. Yeah, I was actually surprised because I I just I guess I didn't remember paying attention to it. Right. But. Yeah, this the way the shots and everything were set up and, and how natural everything looked, it's just it, yeah. it's really fantastic. Yeah, and the lighting, like you were saying, when they when they're walking in the dark with torches, it's it's gorgeous. 
Like it almost feels like they just shot it natural light, but I don't think they did. Did we ever find out who it was that did the cinematography? It seems like we looked that up. Hit Dean Cundy. No. No. <laughs> Um. Oh, yeah, it was the same cinematographer as Aliens. Oh, right. Yeah. And V for Vendetta. So it's like someone that actually knows how to shoot in the dark. Uh, he did James Bond movies, Event Horizon. Yeah. He worked he knows with how Ridley to do Scott. His, his scary bits. So. Oh, and The Princess Bride. So, yeah, yeah, comedy and scary bits. This fucking guy knows how to shoot them. Yeah. So maybe the DP is the guy that saved the movie, really. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Steven Sommer, the rest of his film, maybe it was the DP. Yeah. And the cast, but still. Could have been. Yeah. Well, that's one of those things we've talked about before, how, you know, uh, making a movie is a group effort. That's why there's so many credits at the end of the film. This is this, the same editor that did The Last Jedi. Really? Yes. Wow. That's kind of interesting. This is Ryan Johnson's editor. Huh. And don't leave any comments about Bash and The Last Jedi, because I don't really give a shit. This isn't a Last Jedi podcast. Nobody's going to leave comments. Nope, you're right. Nobody's even going to But if you're listening, it. please leave a comment. Speaking of Game of Thrones, man, that trailer was fucking awesome. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really fucking good. I mean, this guy's all he's done, it, though, editing. I mean, the mummy he edited, that was pretty good. But, like, well, he edited Van Helsing. He fucking edited Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, San Andreas. Season of the Witch, like... So that explains why Ryan Johnson likes him so much. Oh, fuck off. But I don't think the... Uh, the editing wasn't the problem in the movie. It was serviceable and everything else. Well, not the problem. I mean, the editing isn't what saved the movie here. It was, it was serviceable and everything else around it, I think, helped. Oh, they got the uh, same costume designer as Conan the Barbarian. That's pretty oh, really? cool. I thought that the costumes were quite good, though. Yeah. Everyth- everything like that... <laughs> The movie's just well made in general, and it's fun. Like, yeah, I, that's where the budget comes in, right? It has a good look to it. Like, I like Rick's just his outfit. It's not like Indiana Jones iconic, but it's not really trying to be. I don't think like it's not trying to imitate Indiana Jones, but it also is still keeping up with that adventure hero kind of look. Now, do you think Kubrick ever would have made a monster movie if he was still alive? I think he would have been the spearhead of the Dooku of the Dark Universe. He would have been the one at the very head of it. I think he makes movies where the humans are the monsters. Yeah, I know. I was making a fucking joke. No, you were being serious, and I had to quash that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. But there are a lot of sequels for this movie. Well, there's two sequels for this movie, but there it technically are a lot of sequels for this movie if you think about it's spin-offs, Garrett. You don't say. Because you, you don't remember The Mummy Returns all that much, right? Or The Mummy 3. That's the... Well, I didn't watch The Mummy 3. Lucky. I'm pretty sure. I don't... Because that was the one with Jet Li, right? Sure, yeah. That was. Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I saw that one at all. The second one, I really don't remember. It's like, I remember it being on, and I was in the room. But I really don't remember anything about that film. So I just... I rated it as a non-memorable film but i would like to watch it again yeah well we will well i see how it is i mean the the box set i bought wherever it is i'm looking but it's not right here next to me uh it has the three the first three films right so i didn't see scorpion king or anything i don't think that's what i was gonna say is who's uh who's the one of the bad guys in the second one is rock johnson playing the scorpion king Oh, it is okay. Really bad scene. I can't remember. But... Yeah, I can't remember if it was that one or if it was actually the Scorpion King, where it was the really bad. But he scene. did. Then he has a spinoff film, The Scorpion King, which has like fifteen sequels. It's ridiculous. <laughs> wow. I haven't seen any of those movies, but it's like they just keep making them and they keep replacing the actor every single time. At this point, it's kind of nuts. I don't know, like, but they there must be a market for them, right? If they they're all direct to DVD or whatever, but they keep making them i don't know somebody must be watching them if they keep making them if they maybe they can reuse assets or something or maybe they have like access to a filming location so it's just dirt cheap yeah and and maybe they do it to like break even or to say oh yeah it costs us all this money and then they can you know take earnings from other movies and say that they weren't sure you know they weren't in the red or whatever that's the only thing i can think sure 
But it's kind of it's I haven't watched any of them because they all look terrible. Right. So I wouldn't recommend any of that. Well, now I got to watch them. <laughs> what are you doing? Cocaine? Uh huh. OK. And then, of course, there's like we've been talking about a lot. The Dark Universe, which is a complete reboot and does not like this. It ignores this film altogether. I was hoping when I saw it that they were going to have a tie and that Brandon Fraser would show up at the end and be like, I'm here to kill some mummies. But they didn't do it. Uh, that sounds like a terrible idea. Instead, it's just Tom Cruise running around Mission Impossible style while there happens to be a mummy somewhere, I guess. I don't know. It spend, the movie spends like 45 minutes of its time in assorted but places setting up other... At the end, so. isn't it supposed to be where he's the mummy? Yeah. So that's what they were doing. The whole thing was an origin story. which I guess, work. but he just, at the end, he's a, he's a mummy, but he just kind of has like kind of wrapping on his hands. Or some right, shit. because you don't want to cover up his face because he's the star. Yeah, it's the reason why Iron Man flies around everywhere with, uh, you know, our RDJ's our face. DJs. But that movie, <laughs> <laughs> the Tom Cruise Mummy, it only came out a couple of years ago. But that thing is absolutely terrible, terrible. But Russell and, Crowe's in it. Oh yeah, but never mind. It's actually good now. I forgot about him. He makes it all better. But I haven't it, watched it. It like, I'm so glad it didn't make any money because it didn't deserve it, but also because it's like absolutely horrendous. And I think that if it made any money, they would have taken that opportunity to make every single possible. Yeah, but didn't they already do like an Entertainment Weekly photo shoot of like all the? They did before the movie came out. Before the movie came out, everybody that was supposed to be in the universe. So they had like Johnny Depp, who was the going to be the Invisible Man. Uh, Tom Cruise, of course. Russell Crowe was Je- Dr. Jekyll. Um, they had a couple other people. Oh, Javier Bardem was Einstein's monster, I think. And now that's all flushed down the toilet because <laughs> the mummy was terrible. And uh, Alex Kurtzman is a fucking hack. It's not yeah. the Invisible Man, it's the Invisible Franchise. Oh, fuck. I wanted to buy the slide whistle just for moments like that. <laughs> <laughs> But um Oh no. That was I was gonna say that's such a fucking joke. I should have done it. And my Mr. Plinkett voice. Oh. Looks like that's the invisible franchise. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just go ah! <laughs> That was almost Jared Leto's joker. <laughs> I'm going to make this pencil uh, disappear. Uh, disappear. Let's not blow things out of proportion. <laughs> you think you can just steal from us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a squealer. Hi. I'm like a little lost dog. I wouldn't know what to do with one of my caught it. I was just... Do. Poor choice of words. Let's put a smile on that face. I'm an edgelord. <laughs> <laughs> I OD'd on prescription drugs. Let's do an AMA on 8chan. <laughs> God. <laughs> Thanks, THQ. <laughs> wow. Wow. Anyway, the Dooku is dead, and they uh, so dead that they are doing a movie. What movie is it? I forget. But they threw it over to Blumhouse now, did they not? I don't or they're know. they're following the Blumhouse model. They're now going to make a remake of a horror movie, a Universal monster movie, low budget, straight horror. So we can hope for the best that it's going to end up being a decent kind of not a not a Marvel shared universe, but just assorted monster horror films. Because I'm totally down for that it's the monster related water. horror films. Yeah, basically. But like. I don't know how they thought it was a good idea to just to have an entire franchise ready to go and then the movie be fucking like bad, right? Iron Man wasn't thinking about going anywhere until it was a success. They had that little end credits tag, but nobody stayed till the end of the credits and nobody knew what that meant. They didn't set things up really until Iron Man 2. But to have a photo shoot with all of your actors before the movie even comes out is ridiculous. It's such a stupid idea. 
But I don't know. I mean, Universal tried to start a franchise with Dracula Untold in 2013 as well, but it failed. So Whoops. maybe they should just work on doing decent movies rather than shitty ideas. Right. But whatever. I mean, if if they were to reboot the mummy again, don't even have to bring him back, but just do it in the style of this. Like have it just be fun and exciting. That's it. Period. It would people would love it. But when you make it a totally incoherent mess, like the 2017 one that spends way too much time trying to set up other films than it's than just telling its own story, it's pointless. It's 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 ridiculous. The problem is, in order for it to make back the amount of money that they spend on it, that has to be cookie cutter because they won't actually take any chances. I know, but I don't know. And like, look at something like Mission Impossible Fallout, right? It's an established franchise, granted, but it yeah, but did very well. What was the budget well. on that thing? I don't know. Probably $100 million. You wouldn't need to give any more than that to a mummy. Yeah, but see, the thing is, I bet Mission Impossible was probably cheaper because of how much practical Mission effects. Impossible Fallout's budget was $178 million. Right, so if they would have done everything with CG, yeah, but it would have been $300 million. Sure. But like, but you could, they made this movie for $80 million. Right? Why can't you just make it for 150 now? Call it a day. But nobody's going to see that. You're right. It has to be cookie cutter. But I don't know. Get a fun young star in it. Draw in the crowds. But I'm not a movie executive or whatever. So we're done with sequels and remakes to this, probably. They're not going to have any more for it. It's a dead franchise. They're going to slowly build up now, like I said. But. It's unfortunate because right. they lost that fun. They could have had an Indiana Jones esque franchise, and they tried. The second one came out in two thousand and one, which isn't very long after the first one. Maybe it didn't make m- enough money to justify a third one or something. But uh, you know, they tried to. Well, they did a third one later, much later. It was like seven years, eight years later, without the director, without Rachel Weisz, because she couldn't come back. So they just said, "Fuck it, we'll do it anyway." It was the, th- the third point was just people who didn't give a shit and it flopped and it failed. So they just cancel it all together and then eventually they reboot it because Tom Cruise wants to do it. And they have a stagnant property not doing anything, I guess. But it's just it's miserable. It sucks when we could have this fun action adventure franchise. And maybe it's just the adventure fan in me that wants more of this fucking shit. It's it's unfortunate. We don't get these kinds of things We're we're subjected to cookie cutter crap right it's ridiculous what happened to the days of like just generally fun movies making back their budgets or whatever or justifying justifiably being made why where did that go why does everything need to be universe and why does everything need to be cookie cutter it really makes because that's what's successful right now right but it's yeah it's It's just they're risk adverse because of the amount of money and then it's like the thing too i mean the mummy franchise or even if you just take this film, wasn't based on the actual mummy. I mean, it wasn't. Everyone didn't go there to see the Egyptian guy be a mummy. He was barely even a mummy yet. Right. It was mostly like the guy who had like he was barely he was slowly decomposing and he was from Egypt. It wasn't like he spent the entire movie like actually wrapped in bandages. Sure. Well, I mean, so, they did what they needed to do to tell a fun story, and it works. Right. You know, so I I think it's <clears throat> difficult on on these that are like villain centric. Even the new Halloween movie, like Mike Myers, doesn't really push much of the plot along. Right. Like almost all of it is either the humans that he's coming after or the the people that are taking care of him at the facility. It's like that's yeah. you kind of follow everything through the humans, even though he's supposed to be the main character. Right. Um, so you'd actually have to have someone really good working on the script and then you'd have to it, it has to be a perfect storm because you can have sure. a really good script and then have a terrible movie with very little budget and the people will go and they'll be disappointed that it's not more action centric and there's not bigger set pieces or you can do big set pieces but then it, it comes at the cost of uh, you know having characterization and doing anything fun with the people or the actors or maybe you get really good actors, but there's really not anything for them in the script to chew. 
you know, or you spend all your money with Tom Cruise and then you have to have the most generic villain in the world. That's just completely computer generated. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't think that they can put the time and the effort and have everything come together because, you know, as good as the Marvel movies are and as much money as they've made, Disney hasn't been able to replicate that success. They can't release as many star Wars movies as they wanted to. Right. Because people are already getting tired of it. And it's like the whole Pixar thing where they're just doing sequels. They're not making as much money as they were before. And now, even in the animated categories, they're not winning the Oscars that they were. It wasn't automatic that, hey, if a Pixar film is, is nominated, they will win. Mm -hmm. You know, Sony came gangbusters with the Spider-Verse thing and swept it out from under. Right. Well, that's what happens again when you make a good movie. That's that's different or it's exciting and it's just exciting to right. watch. So what what did Sony do with that? They're like, OK, we'll take these animators. We'll let them do the kind of movie that they want to make. We'll try something different. No, they're just going to make a scene. Yeah. I mean, you got to chase the money at the same time, I guess. No, you don't have to. Well, they do. <laughs> they do anyway. Well, the, the mummy made four hundred fifteen million dollars at the box office on its 80 million dollar budget, which is pretty big. Right. The mummy returns it had about a similar budget and made more, made four hundred and thirty. But the thing is, now films are being made for the Chinese market because that's going to be 60, 70 percent of the box office. Right. Well, maybe they should just redo Dragon Emperor, the Chinese mummy. <laughs> there. Now you have your fucking Chinese right, but draw. The, but that's the thing is, like, I don't think the Chinese go to the cinema to see things they would normally see at the Chinese cinema. Right. I think they want Americanized versions of American stories that is, like, OK for Chinese to watch. Yeah. And they have to have simple storylines or they can't actually follow it because of the difference in culture and language. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just want fucking where to where'd all the good shit go. But I'm curious. That's it. That's my statement. Fair enough. It's just unfortunate that I think that we don't get films quite like this all too much anymore that are. Right, but I mean, that's like that's wholesale how it's, entertaining. That's how it's been throughout history. You have these yeah. huge gaps. I mean, you know, like after the Indiana Jones films. What adventure films did you really have? I mean, yeah. maybe like Romancing the Stone? I guess, yeah. You know? So it's like you had some stuff, you had like really cheap knockoffs that, you know, didn't have the budget or the, the talent behind it. And that's the other thing, too. I mean, it, you know, it's we talked about it in the other podcast, but Steven Spielberg changed what kind of films he made. He wanted to mature as a filmmaker. Right. So even if you have someone that's like really good and, and everything falls in perfectly, more than likely they will want to move on and do something else. It's like Yorgos's next movie is not going to be a period piece about, you know, England. He's moving on to something else, even though he did a really right. good job. With it. Sure. So yeah, it's I think it comes in waves. We had like a few really good adventure movies we had talked about before, like around this 90s era. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just like with Westerns. There used to be a ton of Westerns, a ton of really good Westerns. And now, you know, you can count on your hand that the last decade, maybe even 20 years of the really good Westerns. That are right. Been. And a lot of the really good Westerns are neo Westerns or yeah, sure. like, you know, Django, which was actually a Southern. It wasn't even about out West. So right. it's like, you know, and that obviously goes back to the nostalgia thing about, you know, mimicking other movies and using soundtrack for movies and different things like that. But if, Tarantino doesn't want to make a Western again. Okay, Django and Hateful Eight were two of the better new ones, but he's off doing a movie about Hollywood now. Right. Maybe we'll see then, as if it comes in waves, maybe we'll see something like this eventually again, or that new age of adventure kind of come back. Because the second Jumanji wasn't too terrible. It was an adventure movie. So And it made a lot of money. So I think S. Craig is going to make another Western film. Think so? I, th I think that's what he said was his next script. Really, eh? Do you think he'll do a, will it be a horror Western or do you think he'll want to do a straighter one? I think he will do an action Western. Yeah, just super violent. Uh-huh. Well, I'm already excited. <laughs> You're already sold. <laughs> yep, pretty much. I mean, it's just S. Craig, so I'm sold. Yep. I can't wait. A couple weeks, Dread Across Concrete comes out. Yeah, uh, uh, I guess so, eh? Not here, though. You'll have to tell me how it is. Yeah, well, hopefully it'll come here. And hopefully it'll go there at some point. It won't. Back to the mummy. <laughs> And back to its franchising potential. There's actually a theme park room, Mummy Garrett. Did yeah. you know that? Have Tell you been to more. Universal Studios Orlando? 
or Hollywood? Uh, I have been to the Orlando one, but I haven't been to it recently because I don't live anywhere close to there. Me neither. But I went a couple of years ago and they have a mummy ride there. And me, being a huge mummy fan, had to check it out. And I wrote it like 15 times in a row because it is fucking awesome. It's like an indoor roller coaster that has like visuals on the screen and, and mummy statues that jump out at you and all that. Mm-hmm. And Brendan Fraser, who talks to you, it is fucking sick. I think it's just called the mummy or the return of the mummy or some dumb shit like that. So you've but already like, had that revenge, experience. The revenge of the mummy. What? You've already had that experience. What do you mean? Like instead of having a new movie come out, you have the uh, the ride. Yeah, it was three minutes long and I went on it for fucking I had to go on it 15 times in a row. Brendan Fraser shows up at the end. And he's like, wow, wasn't that fun? I'm Brendan Fraser. Oh, oh no, the mummy's going to get me. Ah, that sounds that's, that's what it is. But did, yeah, it's did they have the Back to the well. Future ride when you were there. Nope. Oh, it's already closed. I was sad. Did you ever ride that? Well, no. Did you? Yeah, that was a fun one. Damn it. That was like one of the first ones they opened. Yeah, I know. I wish it was there when I was there. Jaws was close to. Well, I used to live down there. Yeah, because you're a Florida man. Florida man. All gross and rapey. (laughs) Gosh. (laughs) What else do we do for the mummy? I mean, that's got to be it. (laughs) You think so? Yeah, I know. Stretching throughout, but I mean, we had a decent discussion on uh, yeah. on the state of I mean, movies and blockbusters. Yeah, it's, still a, it's a movie podcast, but I mean, you know, even if it's 45, 50 minutes, we'll be good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's good to do a shorter one. I think we had that, like, well, the best of 2018 was 140. Yeah. Um, it's a dangerous game. Oh. Well, if that's it for you, Garrett, is it? Yeah. I think that's all for this one? Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. It's a fun, fun movie, though. And it's it, it's kind of hard to talk about in specifics, uh, but at the end of the day, it's if you haven't seen it, it's definitely watching. It's a a hell of a lot of fun. We haven't decided mystery movie next week. Yeah, everyone doesn't need to know. We're not going to upload it. The yeah. Same, huh? uh, if that's it for the mummy, then you can catch us down here at the Digital Drive In every single week, where we talk about some of our favorite movies and why we love them. Uh, next week, we're going to give leave a little mystery film for you. We don't know what it's going to be yet. That's why. But you'll have to tune in next week to hear what that film is. And hopefully it's one that you like. Otherwise, you probably won't listen. I mean, you're not listening anyway. But, you know. <laughs> hopefully it's one they haven't seen. Hopefully. And we spoil the shit out of it. <laughs> As always, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at digital underscore podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex's Reviews and Garrett on Twitter at Garrett DiNardo. You can follow both of us on Letterboxd by following the links in the description below. And you can also subscribe to us on YouTube. The channel name is Digital Drive-In, and uh, you should see our logo there, and that'd be the one. Or you can just follow links on both Twitters as well. So, mystery movie next week. And thank you all for listening to us ramble about non-essential bullshit for a little around an hour.